I'm Mandy Holloway and I am thrilled to welcome you all to the first episode of The Power of Five. This is a series that brings together five behaviour change specialists and it's all about hearing five voices who are limited to five minutes to talk and share their thoughts on leadership and what's happening in our current world of work and what we're experiencing. Our intention is that you firstly learn something new Secondly, are able to see how to apply it to your situation and very importantly, walk away with actions, things you can do differently, ways that you can look at your leadership differently and make changes in your world of work. So today, we are going to look at the topic of what's the one piece of advice you'd give others about leadership? And now to get us started, it's my absolute delight to introduce you to our first behaviour change specialist. So here is the voice of Mr. Sean Shepherd from the Leadership oh, Advantage. Oh, thank you, Mandy. And <laughs> five minutes. I thought it was 15 minutes we we're getting. I'm timing you. Five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And your time's already started. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you, Mandy. And Mandy, all the way from Australia, thank you for, for joining us. And as Mandy said, the theme tonight is what's one piece of leadership advice that you would give others? And I'm going to start to answer that with a quote. So I do have my notes here. So I'm going to be looking at my notes. Um, there's a quote from Susan Scott, author of a book called Fierce Conversations. Her quote is, our work, our relationships, and our lives succeed or fail one conversation at a time. So the week of March the 16th, our world changed and our personal life changes, our professional life and how we live changed. Everybody knows that. But what happened for me professionally was as a, as a speaker and a facilitator, um, all of my bookings for the next five months immediately got canceled. So. I'm not gonna say, yay, opportunity to learn. <laughs> that was devastating. It was really, really devastating. So what do you do in times when you don't know what to do? Like so many of us right now don't know what to do. Maybe for the first time in our career, we feel lost. I called a friend. I've been watching, you know, who wants to be a millionaire. So I called a friend and I said, I really don't know what to do. And part of his answer was just serve the people that you love and respect. And it was such simple, easy advice and it hit a chord. So immediately when I got off the phone with him, I took pen to paper. Now I work by invite and referral only. So I've already weeded out the people that maybe were not a good fit. And I came up with 22 names of leaders that I love and respect that either I had worked with in the past or I'm currently working with. And I invited them to an event called Social with Sean Virtual Edition. So I do this live in person where I bring clients and cool people together and they bring a friend and we have a great time and I, I use it as an opportunity to do some group coaching. Well, first problem was I didn't have a Zoom account. So I needed to <laughs> sign up for this thing called Zoom and uh, then I wrote an invite on the Zoom, on the Zoom to my virtual socials with Sean. I invited 24 people with the intention of let's have a distraction from our, our current reality for one hour. Let's actually connect and have real conversations amongst ourselves because often leaders, who do you talk to? Like, who do you talk to? The higher you go in the food chain, you have nobody to talk to. And the third thing was, I guaranteed that they would take something away from that socials that would make them smarter that they can apply with their team tomorrow. I launched that two minutes before we're starting, nobody showed up. And I thought, I started, I invited them to a party that nobody's going to come to. And then 14 people showed up. They had real conversations. They talked about the issues that they faced every day. They connected, they laughed, and they left a little bit smarter. At the end of that, somebody said, can we do this again next week? 
And I ended up doing that for six straight weeks. Wow. It even surprised me how much they, how quickly they got together and the opportunity that they never would have had to get in the same room. They were right across North America, one conversation at a time. So what I'm going to say to you is what conversation do you need to have? What conversation do you need to have with you? And what conversation do you need to have with your team? So that's the first thing. And the two questions I'm going to ask you, I'm not gonna leave you just with, who do you need to have a conversation with? Come on, that would be a terrible show. <laughs> the two questions I want to ask is, number one, what have you learned about yourself and your team in the last 90 days? What have you learned about yourself and your team the last 90 days? And number two, what are opportunities are there for you and your team if you're willing to be open and adapt? One conversation at a time, that's where the gold is, but it takes a lot of courage to do that. So I'm proud that I was the, the lead off hitter <laughs> in our new series. Yay, I would like a round of applause from the other four speakers. Thank you. Yay. And I will say from the timer, you were you were pretty bang on, Sean, for the leadoff. So I'm pretty good, oh, right? So, <laughs> uh, so with that, I want to uh, turn it over to Catherine Harrison from Purple Voodoo to take it away with our next nugget of wisdom. Take it away, Catherine. Thank you, Sean. So uh, my my one piece of advice would uh, likely be practice mindfulness. Um, and, I, and I say this because I believe that practicing mindfulness actually enables leaders to improve on any other leadership skill or leadership behavior that they're trying to do, not, not just through a global pandemic, but just in uh, being the most effective leader they can be in general. So, you know, for years, if not decades, we know that the most effective leaders have self-awareness. Right? That's like an essential trait of all effective leaders. And it's about understanding your personality, understanding your preferences and your tendencies and your habits and behaviors and thinking patterns, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly, um, that uh, self-aware leaders are comfortable and, and curious and courageous enough to actually look in the mirror on a regular basis and find out what's going on. And additionally, as humans, we all have that ever-present thought bubble happening up here uh, with self-talk, again, good, bad, or sad, with um, certainly these days especially myriad bits and bytes of information that keeps us distracted. And even when we're having a conversation or when we're on a Zoom webinar, there's a million other things happening all at once. And, and so mindfulness and the practice of mindfulness is the ability to observe all of that chatter, to observe all of that noise, to notice the patterns perhaps, um, some of our tendencies, some of those deep grooves that we have um, come to kind of in a rope fashion, just follow along. Um, and it enables individuals and leaders particularly to distance themselves a little bit from that and be fully present. And so be fully present to the task at hand, be fully present to the conversations at hand. Sean just mentioned conversations are so critical. Um, be fully present to the decision-making at hand. And so mindfulness really helps to steady a leader and particularly in times of chaos and uncertainty and volatility and pandemics steadiness is such a, a critical um, uh, characteristic and behavior and skill and that steadiness in a leader helps to provide steadiness with with their staff and their peers um, one of the cool things about practicing mindfulness is it's not about not feeling or not thinking things as humans i mean we're, we're messy animals and you know we come with a whole bunch of really um interesting triggers and patterns and things. It's just about noticing them and being able to truly identify and name what they are. I mean, even the Dalai Lama says, I get angry. 
I'm a human, I get angry. But then he's learned how to notice the anger and unpack it a little bit and say, hey, you know, what's, what's happening here? So practicing mindfulness enables a leader over time to develop a strength and a resiliency, a sense of humor, some humility. And, and one of the things that I love, um, this phrase I heard is the degree to which you can be present and friendly towards yourself is the degree to which you can do that with others. Mm. So in, in wrapping up, I think that practicing mindfulness really would enable leaders to be the best leaders they can possibly be, be as present as they can be in all of the other behaviors and skills that they're seeking to develop um, and be the best support for their own folks. And the cool thing is, my one tip is, Google how to practice mindfulness right now. <laughs> and you, you will find so many different ways. And, and, and really the, the recommendation is to experiment and play and find the best practice that actually resonates most with you. There's not one best way to practice mindfulness, um, but have fun with it. I mean, we're fun, we're fun humans. So play around with it and see if it helps your, your leadership um, go to another level, even in the midst of some challenging times. Good stuff. Yay. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and so I have the privilege, I believe, of handing it to my wonder twin, Mr. Joel Bennett. <laughs> da, 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 da. In Iowa. Joel, yeah. And, and this is a early uh, birthday present for both Catherine and I, who will be, I think we're turning 30 in a couple of days. So I hope, uh, hope all of you got us a gift. A couple of years older, I'm 32, but yeah. I didn't yeah. want either of you a gift. That's all right. So leadership, that's a, it's a great topic. So early in my career, I was given the opportunity to lead a team. And while I was excited to take on the challenge, I was somewhat terrified. Um, okay, I was a lot terrified. Uh, but like many new leaders, I had a ton of questions. Uh, questions like, what does it mean to be a leader? Uh, what does leadership really look like? Uh, how can I set my team up for success? How can I set myself up for success? And most of all, will anyone actually follow me? And so I attended training. I read various books about leadership and management theory. I even went off and got a master's degree. Uh, but luckily, I had some great mentors along the way. And I tried and I failed and I tried some more and had some successes along the way. But over 15 years later, I've realized that being an effective leader is much simpler than I first thought. Um, I believe that your main focus as a leader is to build the capability of your team. And you can do this by filling really three main roles, the role of an architect, the role of an engineer, and the role of a builder. So an architect creates a vision for their team and sets direction. An engineer defines the resources that are needed to get there. And a builder does the hard work it takes to bring that vision to fruition. So Jesus said it this way, suppose you want to build a tower. Wouldn't you first sit down and create a plan and see if you have the resources to complete it? If you pour the foundation, but you're not able to finish the tower, everyone who sees you will ridicule you saying, well, they can start, but they're not able to finish. And for me, there's something very simple and very wise in that analogy. So first, you need to begin with the end in mind. And you can't do this on the fly. Um, you can't do that and expect to see any sort of success. You must have a plan. You need to get your resources in order and involve others in the process. So to build and to lead a successful team, you need to wear each of these hats effectively. So over the course of the next week, I really challenge you to take time and sit and think about each of those three hats and determine how you'll take action to reach your goals. So first, be an architect. Create that vision for your team. Where are you headed and what's it gonna look like when you get there? You need to paint a very clear picture and get very clear on what it looks like. Then gather your team up and communicate this to them so that they can understand it. Ask them for their thoughts and concerns. And once the vision is clear, ask for their commitment before you set out to complete it. The key is making your vision evergreen. So you need to revisit it often. You're gonna to need to uh, weigh your priorities against it. You need to cut out distractions and make adjustments to the circumstances that, 
the, if those circumstances require it. The second piece is to be an engineer, to create the plan that you want to achieve uh, to, to reach your vision. So determine what tools and resources are needed, put them in place, set your team up for the best chance of success. But remember, you can't be successful if your team isn't successful. So you need to make sure your people have the skills they need to reach their goals and include them in the process and ask them if they have what they need to be successful. And if they don't have the skills they need, create development plans and provide them the time, the space, and the resources to level up. If you don't have the right people in place currently on your team, spend time hiring people who not only have the skills that you need, but are also passionate about the vision you've developed. And most importantly, assess what barriers exist and come up with ways to remove them. If you can't remove barriers from your team, they're not going to be able to perform the way you expect. And the last piece is be a builder. So it's time to execute your plan, but you need to focus on your people first. You can't do this all by yourself. So you need to delegate responsibilities based on strengths, provide stretch opportunities for team members to grow, and build time into your schedule daily, weekly, and monthly for team discussions and one-on-one -on -one meetings. Set expectations with them, review progress, and provide coaching and encouragement along the way. And when you reach your milestone, make sure you stop to celebrate it. So what's in it for you? Well, leaders who balance these two roles effectively experience higher team engagement, ownership and productivity. They build trust with their teams because of their preparation and transparency. And strangely enough, they have a much higher likelihood of achieving, achieving the vision that they created. So once again, I'm gonna lay down the challenge. If you want to be an effective leader, be an architect, be an engineer, and be a builder. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Todd Atridge from Different Matters to share his own thoughts. Cool, thanks Joel, appreciate that. 459. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I will cede my extra second to Todd. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? I only got like four minutes, so I'm just going to keep passing this thing along. Um, here's my advice. My one piece of leadership advice is you don't need to be perfect. And although we all know this, we all know in our hearts, you know, imperfection's fine. At the end of the day, there is so much pressure placed on us, either by ourselves by our organizations, by the social consciousness of what we believe leaders should be, that we have to have everything all buttoned up. So, you know, maybe the expectation is, you know, we have to have all the answers, or maybe the expectation is we always have to be right, or maybe the expectation is we always have to make the right decisions. Well, we're in an environment right now with COVID and so on where that pressure can feel overwhelming. When I'm taking my teams back to work, do I have to have the right decisions? Do we have to do it right the first time? Do we have to make sure that everyone is settled in and I'm doing right by everybody? And we feel that pressure, and it's natural for us to feel that pressure. But listen, we come by this so honestly, because when we start our careers, we start as individual contributors. And as individual contributors, we get rewarded for being right for producing results, for doing all those good things. And we're trying to get promoted, and so we're constantly doing all this stuff that is really good stuff. And then the day comes and we get promoted. And now we're leading a team, and that's fantastic. But we haven't made the jump from the fact that I'm not being rewarded for what I did, I'm now being rewarded for what my team does. And so we stay in this place as leaders of, I have to be right, I have to know the answer. I have to be able to produce. That pressure can kill you, but on top of all that, it absolutely robs your team of the opportunities that they would have if we just open it up to them. Because it's the team's achievements that are really important. And this is where collaboration comes from. This is where teamwork comes from. This is where decentralized decision-making comes from. Now, you compound that, by working in a culture of failure isn't an option, and it's game over. And I've worked with so many leaders over the years where they just don't let themselves be imperfect. 
And here's what happens. So if I have, if I have to have all the right answers as the leader, if that's the belief I have, I have to have all the right answers. Well, it only leaves one thing, which is everyone else has to have the wrong answers. <laughs> that's the only alternative. I have all the right ones. So then you guys have to have all the wrong ones. If I have all the answers, well, then that means you can't have any answers. In fact, they're right here. I have all the answers. So how could you possibly have any? I have them all right here. If I have to make all the right decisions, well, that means that you folks have to make all the wrong decisions. And so this cycle is so uh, toxic that what happens to our followers is they become disengaged because followers actually want to work with leaders who need them. And if you don't need me because you have all the answers and you're always perfect and you make all the right decisions, well, what's my role? And so I'll go find someone else that I can go work with who actually needs me. And so that's where perfection can really get into the way of things. So the stance behind this is it takes away honest communication. It takes away collaboration. There's no autonomy. There's no agility. And the pressure that mounts on the leader can be debilitating. And in fact, a lot of leaders end up derailing their careers because they feel they have to get it right and they always have to get it perfect. One other place that this shows up, especially when it comes to, I have to have all the decisions or I have to make all the decisions, is you, you become the bottleneck. There become the long line of people in front of your office who are waiting for you to find out what they're supposed to do next. And then these leaders are the same leaders who go, I have no time. I don't know what it is. I've got all these people around me. I have no time to do my own work. Well, of course you don't because all these people are waiting for you to make the decision and tell them what to do next. So the way to get rid of that is just to allow them to step in and be in that place. Okay, so here's my challenge. Try using some really simple phrases. Simple phrase number one, I don't know, what do you think? It's a simple, simple phrase. I don't know, what do you think? Even if you think you have the answer, I don't know, what do you think? That opens the door for other people to go, well, here's how I would do it. This is what I would do. This is what I think. And that starts building collaboration. The more you include them, the better. Now, here's the trick. You can't ask them what they think and play the guess what's in my head game, because that game sucks, right? That game's only fun for one person, right? Hey, what do you think? Well, I think, no, 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 we wouldn't do that. That game sucks, right? So you have to be open to the idea that as they tell you what it is, you're in, you're game in. But try that. I don't know, what do you think? The other one that you can uh, use is, I think I made a mistake on that. That's an easy one for people to open up, right? I think I made a mistake on that. How else could we have done it? Okay, so that's your challenge. Remember, you don't need to be perfect. That's my advice, you do not need to be perfect. Embrace it, love it, that's exactly where you're supposed to be. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our final presenter, uh, my friend Mandy Holloway from Courageous Leaders all the way. Thank you so much, Todd. And look, my one piece of advice, and it sort of encapsulates what a lot of you have said, is to bring your human kindness into the workplace every day when you lead. So the stories we've been telling ourselves for years, and I know I've been on the receiving end of them, is firstly, you need to be professional and there is no place for emotion in business. We went on further to say, and I don't know if you ever had those talks when you got made a manager, Mandy, do not be too friendly with people. It will cloud your judgment. So straight away, we go, oh, I, I have to remove myself from being around people. We went even further to label that capability as soft skills. Right? Who wants to be soft when they're leading, right? Especially with the third element of the story is that we are held to account as leaders to hard, tough KPIs that result to short-term bottom line results. Our remuneration, our position, our future is resting on that. So who wants to be soft? What I want to do is share with you why does it matter? Why am I saying bring human kindness into the workplace? Well, firstly, I've got five points. The first one 
is we need more human beings, not human doings, especially when we're moving out of crisis into recovery. We're also looking down the, the neck or whatever we want to call it, the big hole of economic downturn. We've also been talking about it for years. I've been at lots of conferences where we talk about artificial intelligence that's going to open up for leaders to be more human. So we, we know that we actually need to be more human. But what does it mean? What is it going to take to be human? Well, the first thing, and, and many of you have spoken about it, is going to take enormous courage because we're going to have to disrupt the status quo. People are not necessarily going to agree with you. They're going to label you soft. It's going to require trust, a deep level of trust. I'm going to have to be a lot more open with my intent. I'm going to have to use a much stronger level of integrity and, and be transparent with it. If I do that, it's going to require a lot more vulnerability. As I talk about these, the person that comes to mind, the global leader that, that comes to mind, and look, I am favoured because she comes down from our part of the world, is Jacinda Ardern, mm -hmm. New Zealand Prime Minister. And she is showing that by being a human and bringing kindness, she is connecting with other humans. And we all, as we've heard from, from Todd, we want to feel like we're needed. We want to feel like we're belonging. We have to find a place for emotion. We have to dismiss this myth about being professional means that I don't bring me as a human into the workplace. Because if I come in as a human and I bring kindness, it means I have to be okay with emotion. And if I do that, I'm going to have a deeper and more real connection with people in the workplace. Now, why do we run away from that word kindness? because we think it's soft, we think it's fuzzy and warm. I'm gonna to say to you, it's not. To be kind requires you to be honest, to be real and authentic and tell the truth. I had, just before I was due to start a leadership program, two weeks out, the CEO pulled me aside and he said, I was working with him and all of his direct reports. And he said, Mandy, I want my people to stop being nice to each other. I looked at him. He said, you don't know what nice means, do you? And I went, well, no, you might have to tell me. He says, nothing in me cares enough to tell you the truth. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. We often are nice to each other because one of the comments that if you think about, all of us remember, we talk about needing to be cruel to be kind. So we think the truth is being cruel. No, it's not. The truth is being kind. If we want to do what Joel says, develop capability in people, if people are not performing, we need to tell them the truth, not talk about them behind their backs. So being kind is hard. It's not soft. And we can actually reframe that as our competitive advantage. So my call to action is in the next week, I'm going to challenge you to be a human. And you can choose one of these five things. One, bring emotion into your workplace every day. If you don't want to do that, do the second one. Be kind. Show compassion and care towards the other humans you work with every day. Or the third one, trust others. As Lao Tzu said, no trust given, no trust received. Give trust. The fourth one, Empathise with others. Really understand what they're going through as we're going out of crisis and into recovery. Or number five, embrace and own your vulnerability. Those are the five I challenge you. You could even do all five. I want to leave you with the wise words of someone that Catherine referred to, the Dalai Lama. People were created to be loved. Things were created to be used. The reason why the world is in chaos is because things are being loved and people are being used. People want to feel like they matter. When they feel significant, when they feel needed, they perform at their best. They deliver outstanding service to clients and customers and they improve your bottom line. But focus on the humans and being kind to them. That's my advice. Thanks. And I'm going to hold on. <laughs> Preach, <you>. Mandy. <laughs>
I'm going to hand over to Joel, who's going to talk about the heartbeat that holds all of us five humans together. Thanks, Joel. And thanks, Mandy. So people may wonder what brings the five of us together. It, it feels like an old joke. The, an American, an Australian, and three Canadians walk into a bar. Um, we have the best with, beer, by the way, in that bar. Well, that's <laughs> up for debate. But uh, really, we're just a group of international comp uh, of consultants that share kind of a philosophy and a methodology around the impact that human behavior has on business results. So we're all familiar with the famous definition of insanity, doing the same things the same way, but expecting a different result. Um, and the methodology that we use solves for that. In other words, that we, if we change the outcomes, uh, we can reshape the way things are done. And so the change model we use is tried, it's tested, it's true across hundreds of organizations around the world. And it has four simple steps. The first is content. Second is context. The third is action and insights. And best of all, anybody can use it. So here's how it works. Uh, as with any change, once you've identified what it is, you need to bring awareness to your team through reading, training sessions, videos, or other means. And we call this content. But content is never a one-size-fits-all equation. The application of content is unique to everyone in the organization, depending on their role, their function, and so people need the opportunity to see how it applies to them. We call this context. And at this point, they're beginning to see the kind of the what's in it for me. So now comes the big jump. You need people to move from their old behavior to the new behavior. So they know what to do, which is the content, and they know how it will make their life better, which is the context. So now it's time to take action. So action is the act of behaving differently than we were before until a new habit forms. And so the key is what's the new behavior that needs to be adopted and how can I create habits to get me there? So as we know, nothing is perfect. So it, as that we practice that behavior, your people will try, they'll fail, they'll try again, and each time they'll learn something a little bit new. Um, they'll learn how to improve their results over time. So this is where we measure the impact of the practice uh, toward those goals uh, that we set up at the beginning of the program, and we call these insights. And these insights will inform you on what's the next piece of content that we need to pull forward to help people continue to learn. So what is that thing that people are struggling with? Well, that's the beginning of a new cycle of content, context, action, and insight. And if you continue to use this cycle, which we call the heartbeat, you'll begin to see performance improve and you'll see your organization change for the better. Catherine. Yes, well, you know what, that's, it's interesting. What's jumping into my mind is because you're talking at the end of that is around the human behavior that not only is applied, but then habitualized and is turned into skills that can be done, you know, um, well and often and consistently. And it ties back to what, what seemed to be a pretty common element through all of our um, five minute musings is the human first focus, right? Is really looking at everybody in the organization. We talked about it from a leadership lens, but certainly, everybody in the organization is a human first. And, and, and that seemed to be a common thread. So perhaps what we can do now is just to, to weigh in. We've, we've all had our five minutes of fame. Um, I'd love to just invite everybody to, to comment and what were some of the things that stood out? We didn't hear these things prior to getting on this call together. So it was really, it was really can you cool. Tell us it's not rehearsed? <laughs> um, I'll jump in because I've been quiet for 28 minutes. So. A record. Uh, yeah, it is a record. Um, a couple of things. You know, this time that we've been apart, I've actually had the most intimate, real conversations that I've had in many, many years. And we've seen into people's houses. We've met their dogs and cats and kids and all of that. And that really goes to what you were just saying, Catherine, about being human. Being human first. And often when a client calls, they will say, here are the KPIs or here are the outcomes and all the, the business speak, which, which is what we're all about. We're all about getting your outcomes. But when you ask the question, like Joel just did, what are the behaviors needed? Often there's a pause because nobody's ever asked them that question. 
And when we actually dive into that, that's when we create sustainable lasting change. And that's something that we're all passionate about that brought us all together. Um, and the other quick thing that I'll say is Todd's point about perfection. You know what? There's never been a time that people have been more forgiving about imperfection. National TV shows are freezing out on Zoom. <laughs> like, come on, just get on the field and experiment. That's where all the growth is. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think I think picking up on on what I think Catherine said as well, and it sort of intimate it links with what Todd was saying, is that as humans we're messy. So our natural instinct is not, we're not perfect, but we've learned to be perfect in the workplace, be professional, look professional, all that kind of stuff, um, where there is never a time now, like now, that we actually need to be human because people, I don't know what you're experiencing, but there's a, you know, at the people leader level in Australia at the moment, so not the top level, but that next level, they are feeling completely overwhelmed. You can feel it in their body because they are usually the ones that have young children. They're now worried about how do I get my kids to school? I'm not allowed to use public transport. I've got a boss who's now saying we're returning to work and expects me to go back to what was. And I'm just feeling completely uh, like uh, I'm just a mess. Mm -hmm. And we're expected to go and turn up and be professional. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Well, you know, it's funny, Mandy, to that point. Um, you know, uh, parent shame is such a, a huge thing to begin with, right? I'm not good enough as a parent. Everyone else is doing it better. I don't know, you know, and then you layer on that having to work from home and like shame's falling from the sky, right? People are just feeling really, really bad about themselves. Uh, and this is really where we need to embrace our humanity. And, and Sean, I totally agree with you that we now have glimpses into everyone's homes. We see their children, we see their pets, we see how they live. It humanizes us in such a way, like I can totally see uh, the future uh, being, you know, organizations who come out of this will be communities versus companies, right? Those will be the ones that survive, the ones that reinvent themselves as a community of individuals who do good in the world versus a company, because we know each other. And, uh, you know, we talk about humanity and leadership and, and Mandy, I think Jacinda is an excellent uh, example because didn't she just get uh, awarded or named the most effective national leader on the planet? Yeah. And yeah. she happens to be the most human of them as well. And, you know, so we're not talking about the ones who are machine rolling over anyone or jamming through policy. We're talking about the one who's the most human is the one who's the most effective in the world. So yeah. I, I think she that's actually, a, oh, sorry. Story, Mandy. No. I just say it, it, it brings up something else that keeps bubbling up is the necessity now, and, and here's a great opportunity to really change the paradigm between thinking that it's one or the other, right? You either are a very thoughtful, analytical, results-oriented, focused driver of outcomes, or you are a human first, soft skilled, emotionally intelligent, mindful leader, right? Up until recently, and, and I think this still happened, there is a paradigm, there's a belief system that you can be either or, but you can't be both. And, and I think right now, and that's a perfect example, is oh no, not only can you be both, but they complement each other, sure. right? And if you start be behaving and bringing in other skills and learning in that contextual model that Joel was articulating, you start to get some incredible momentum within your community, right? And which is your company. And, and so it's even just changing that, the belief system around the duality or the binary nature of that is so exciting, I think. And it's coming to the, it's coming to the forefront right now. I think I think it's a, a huge reframe that's needed because I know myself, I'm going to be really out there, I was quite shocked when I travelled to New Zealand before COVID that they don't have the same love for Jacinda that we all do externally, right? Because she's not protecting their GDP. Well, she wasn't. So we see, and I love the fact that she has a happiness index and her the happiness index is just as important as GDP, and, but it's about re-educating, mm -hmm. and I hate to say it, but it's the boomer, the white boomer males who are running the corporations, 
and are complaining about her not being good enough because we have to reframe that it's not either or, it's both, and they're both mm. equally important. And I don't think we've got there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a great chat um, by some futurists early on in this whole thing. They said that the, moving forward, it cannot be about growth. It has to be about progress. Very different. Yeah. You know, I think for me, in listening to, to the four of you speak, I think the one thing that bubbled up for me is this whole thought process around to be a good leader, you have to be able to, to take risk and be courageous. Um, and going back to, you know, it's, there's a risk and there's some courage needed to be human in the workplace, if, especially if you feel like you're the only one doing it. Um, there's risk in stepping into messy conversations or not being sure about what to do. And so you're expecting to be perfect in, in a very imperfect world. And so if, I, if I'm okay being imperfect, but everybody else expects perfection, that's a big risk. And so it takes courage. Yeah. And so I, I think that's what's been interesting to me, especially over the last number of months with COVID is in some ways we've kind of been stripped down, uh, I guess in our pajamas for many of us, uh, to be able to sit back and go, I, I don't necessarily know what the hell I'm doing, right? Nobody does. And so I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to lean into this. My emotion is going to show from time to time. And I'm going to take that risk and be courageous. And I think the people that are doing that are seeing the rewards. I think they're seeing the trust from their, their team members um, and understanding that I'm, I'm much more willing to follow somebody who's imperfect and open than somebody who thinks they're perfect. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see as we return to work, as we return to what everybody wants to be normal, uh, how, how we evolve in that way, if we're willing to continue to lean into being uh, courageous and taking the risk. Yeah, and that word evolution, Joel, is so critical. That's what's happening. And I'm sure I, I, you, you all, I'm sure, are hearing this, you know, when are we going to return to normal? Not going to happen. We are evolving forward through this, um, hopefully for the better. And um, I think that that notion of evolution and adaptation and constantly, you know, laying the bricks down as you're uh, creating the path, as it were, is, is fascinating and also scary and, and, and overwhelming for all of us humans going through this. Yeah. And I think, the, you know, to, to have that level of courage, it means that we have to challenge the status quo we have to walk in with the confidence and the data and all that sort of stuff to say well we, we don't want to go back to nor what was we want to evolve so that means challenging and I know in Australia at the moment there's been a lot of conversation around the level of trust because obviously if I'm going to go in and challenge I have to have trust that that challenge is going to be received constructively if that makes sense. Otherwise, I could be judged as being a troublemaker and all this sort of stuff. And when people are feeling at risk with their jobs, if trust isn't high, then that has an impact on how much courage people are going to have. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we look globally, trust is probably at an all-time low at the moment. So we have to work really hard to develop and increase the level of trust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and I think... We couldn't end it any better way than that, Mandy, that um, the people that we're helping, we've already built up that trust and you've already built up that trust with many um, people that you're serving right now. I think it's also an opportunity for us to be better um, in every area of our life. And I do really think that we're seeing things with a fresh set of eyes. There are things that we had not seen before. Um, mm -hmm. All five of us, and I think if we're honest, we didn't see ourselves doing this a month ago. <laughs> Maybe even a week ago. <laughs> yeah, you know? No. <laughs> so, so what is possible now that we did not see before? I did not see three different countries coming together uh, without anybody leaving, not only not getting on an airplane, not leaving their bedroom, right? <laughs> or their office at home. So what is possible for everybody out there? That's what I would like to leave with you tonight. Um, I wanna thank Catherine, I wanna thank Joel, Mandy, Todd, and the millions of viewers that have taken in the first episode of The Power of Five. 
when they're doing a documentary on us in about five years, you can honestly say, honestly say that you were there for the first episode. So let's get a, a round of applause. For Yay! <laughs> we did it. If, uh, if you found this helpful, um, please share it. Please leave us comments if there's topics that you'd like us to explore. Please let us know. Um, if you hate it every minute Keep it to of it, yourself. then yeah. <laughs> don't be <laughs> caught. <laughs> it was nice knowing you. Um, but to everybody, thank you for your time. Have a good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you're watching. And tune in next time, because this is not a one and done. Episode two coming soon. Bye for now. Bye, guys. Take Bye. Care.